Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I have to admit to feeling a bit of trepidation after following that inspiring um, and very moving film. So I will try and be um, short and snappy. Um, and to what I would like to do is put the studies of uh, Jane Goodall's studies of chimpanzees into a broader context of um, studying apes in general, and hence the name of this talk, Why Study Apes? Well, my first, um, my first answer to that question is somewhat selfish, um, especially since this forward button doesn't Technology, I do not know. Is now even the advanced button? Sorry. Is it? This is still well, it worked before. It sure did. It sure did. Is the battery gone? No, the battery's on, and it's not even advancing here on the computer. Okay, so we got froze. Yeah. Elliot, I think we're froze. Can you unfreeze us? As I was saying. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Hooray. Thank you very much. So as I was saying, uh, the first reason um, that I'm going to give you for studying apes is a very selfish one, which is that it's really, really fun. And there, it really is nothing quite like being uh, up close and personal with a wild animal, especially when that animal is a great ape and uh, you feel a real connection with that animal. This is me sitting next to an adult female gorilla. Um, but it did work, but it is not advancing anymore. Um, an adult female gorilla, I'm the one wearing the hat. <laughs> oh, no. Now the other reason, I'm just going to keep talking, okay? Now the other reason, of course, that you learn from this film to study apes is that they're our closest living relatives. Uh, we, we were actually on the way to being humans before chimps branched off from, um, from, our, from the main line leading to humans. And you saw in the film how um, learning about the tendencies and behavior of our closest living relatives can tell us something about ourselves. For instance, Jane Goodall changed what was conventional wisdom about what was uniquely human, like making tools or possibly organized warfare. Louis Leakey, um, the person who spearheaded her study and uh, sponsored, helped sponsor her work and get funding, was a true believer that studying our closest relatives, studying great apes, could inform us about the behavior in societies of our human ancestors. And here's the, this, this is the human ape tree, just to stress what I was saying about um, apes being our closest living relatives. Now, Leakey also, he, Louis Leakey believed that studying just one species of ape wasn't enough. What you really want to do is study several closely related living species to understand how and why they differ. And by doing that, you can get at the forces in evolution that might have shaped their behavior and their societies, and then be better able to extrapolate back to our um, early ancestors. And this was why uh, Louis Leakey um, helped launch not just Jane Goodall, but I just need the laser pointer here. Um, Barute Galdicas, who uh, started a study of 
uh, orangutans in Borneo that is still continuing today, and Diane Fossey, who went to study gorillas, and that's, she's the one uh, that I worked with. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is compare, uh, give you just a, a brief comparison of chimpanzees and gorillas, um, touch on some of the reasons why they're so different. Um, I'm not going to deal with orangutans in this comparison because there isn't any time. But trust me, these closely related species could not be more different in their societies, which makes them absolutely fascinating for comparison. Now, Diane Fossey went um, to Africa in 1967, a few years after Jane Goodall had started, to begin her study of mountain gorillas. And she chose as her site the Virunga volcanoes, which are very high mountains of montane forest straddling the borders of Rwanda, Uganda, and Congo. This habitat is extremely different from Gombe Stream, where Jane Goodall worked. Uh, uh, Diane's camp at Karasoki was at 10,000 feet in the forest, and one of these mountains went up to 14,000 feet. So it was extremely cold and high, and we did not wear shorts like Jane. We wore woolly hats and long underwear. Now, just to put you in the picture with gorillas, the colored areas on this map are the areas of gorilla distribution. They are, uh, occur in two main um, areas across equatorial Africa. Most gorillas in the world are western lowland gorilla, uh, gorillas in west central Africa. To the east and eastern Zaire, there's um, another, there are the eastern lowland gorillas, and that tiny red blob there represents the two populations of mountain gorillas. So mountain gorillas are the least common and, uh, type of gorilla, and they exist in only two populations in this area. Now, one of the biggest influences on animals' behavior and society are ecological. Gorillas favor dense undergrowth, and this is why they love the montane forest uh, in the Virungas. Everything, there are at least, I don't know, three or four gorillas in this picture. You might be able to see one right in the middle there, right in the middle there. Um, and when you move through this forest, it's just like walking through a dense green wall. Gorillas are surrounded by their food. They, mountain gorillas basically live in one gigantic salad. <laughs> and they, you know, they really thrive on roots, shoots, and leaves. In comparison to chimpanzees, who, although they do eat some green vegetation, they cannot live by leaves alone. And chimpanzees really require ripe fruit. Now, in the habitat here, there's virtually no fruit because it's too high. And chimpanzees would not fare well here at all, whereas gorillas thrive. Now, this is not to say that gorillas don't eat fruit anywhere. Um, the Virungas is the only place where neither chimps nor fruit occur. In other parts of Africa, they will eat ripe fruit when it's available. In fact, they eat a lot of fruit that chimpanzees eat. But the point is, they don't have to. When fruit is scarce, gorillas can switch to salad, whereas chimpanzees have to keep searching for their fruit fix. And while fruit is a much uh, more, is a much richer, higher in calorie, higher in energy food, much higher quality food than vegetation, it's also harder to find, um, it's less predictable, uh, and it's less abundant than gorilla's main food. Now this difference in diet between chimpanzees and gorillas leads to differences in the way they move around the forest. And you saw from the 
film, Jane, that chimpanzees can really move fast and they travel much faster and much further than gorillas do on their daily search for food. Um, when you try and keep up with a group of gorillas, it's actually not that difficult. As you, here's I am, here I am with one of the study groups. Most of the time, you can keep up with them at a fairly steady walk, whereas researchers of chimpanzees have to sometimes run through the jungle to keep up with their subjects. Now another big influence of a big difference between um, chimpanzees and gorillas is body size. Gorillas of course are famous for being so big and gorilla males weigh about 374 pounds whereas a chimpanzee male maybe 120, 125 pounds. So there's a big difference in body size between them. And let me just go back to there. I want you to notice also, this is an adult female, that's an adult male, the huge difference in size between males and females in gorillas. Plus males get a saddle of silver hair on their back, a huge crest of bone for the attachment of jaw muscles. So there's a lot of differences between males and females in gorillas. This is a phenomenon known as sexual dimorphism, which means the difference in shape and size between the sexes. And I just want to, this is the only graph I'm going to show you. Ignore, whoops. Uh, ignore uh, chimps and the bonobo is another species of, of chimpanzee, but the, the histogram on the left are males and these stripy ones are females. And this is just to show you how different gorillas and chimps are in the extent of their sexual dimorphism and how our species is much closer to uh, chimps than they are to gorillas. Now another big difference between chimps and gorillas in their societies is the stability of their social groups. Gorillas live in groups usually consisting of one adult male, several, several adult females, and their associated offspring, and they stay in these groups for a long time. They're very stable, they're always together. The average amount of time that a male and female in a group mate together um, and spend, uh, live together in a group as mates is 10 years. So they're, they're very stable, uh, and when I say they live in groups, they're sort of within grunting distance of each other. In these groups, male-female bonds are really the glue that holds the group together. These groups are based on the attraction of females to a particular leading adult male. And as infants are born into the group, they acquire this attraction to the adult male. So the, the leading silverback is pretty much a focus of the group. Compare that to the chimpanzees that you just saw, where, as they said, they live in a fission fusion society. <coughs> animals come together, animals separate. Animals come together, animals separate. They don't always stay together in a solid little group. So they're a, they're a community of individuals that know each other, that have very flexible groupings. And the reason for this is their diet of ripe fruit. Their diet does not support continuous um, cohesion among a group of animals. Sometimes a bunch of chimps get together in a tree when it's fruiting and sometimes the whole community is there. Other times there'll only be a, a few, few fruits in a tree so it can only accommodate some animals. So uh, the, the nature of their society and their relationships is heavily influenced by their diet. Now another difference between these groups is the number of adult males per group. I told you that in, uh, in most uh, gorilla groups across Africa there's only one fully adult male or silverback, which means that what you basically have is a one male mating system. 
bunch of females stay with a male and the lead and the dom the silverback is the father of the infants in the group. Now in mountain gorillas, there are rather more groups that have multi-male, multi-male groups. Uh, in fact, about 30% of the groups in mountain gorillas have multi-male groups. So what happens in groups with more than one silverback, what happens with mating? You know, how do these guys compete for mates? Well, uh, DNA work and paternity tests has revealed that it's still pretty skewed towards the dominant male. He sires 85% of the offspring. The subordinate male, um, the subordinate male gets a little bit of action, you know, and, and he sneaks a copulation here and there, sires a few offspring, but basically he has to bide his time waiting to take over dominance from, from the leading male. Now the way that you get more than one male in a group is not by males coming into the group, it's by males not leaving. Most males leave the group they were born in when they reach, reach about 10, 11 years of age. Every so often, a male will stay in the group. So when you see multi-male groups, it's because males have grown up into the group and they just bide their time waiting to usur usurp the dominant position from the leading male. However, this gets rather old for most males, and they get fed up with the dominant male hogging all the mating. And most of them, when their backs are starting to turn silver, they think they can do better <laughs> somewhere else. And what they do then is they leave the group they were born in, they wander around alone, sometimes for years, and what they're doing is meeting up with other groups, other heterosexual groups, and trying to get the females to join them. And that is how new groups form, is when females leave their group and join a lone male, a lone silverback. Now, these times when males from different groups or lone silverback in a group meet up are times of high drama. And this is when chest beating displays, uh, foliage smashing displays, they really come into the fore. And what the males are doing is they're trying to impress the females by saying, look how big and strong I am, and they're trying to um, intimidate the other male. And this sort of competition between silverbacks is really mano a mano kind of fighting. This is how silverbacks fight. This picture was taken in a zoo. Um, notice how they're launching themselves at each other, opening their mouths wide. Um, there was a study done in West Central Africa where they were able to watch a lot of different groups and take data on them. And then they did paternity analysis from, uh, from collecting dung samples. And they have surmised, they worked out that bigger males have more females in their group and they have more surviving offspring in their group. So the bigger a male is, the more successful he is in mating competition, in the great mating game, which is really what life is all about. This importance in individual size goes back to the sexual dimorphism I was talking about. Gorilla males, there's a lot of pressure on them in the course of evolution to get big and strong because that's what's going to get them the girls and that's what's going to get them the infants. Now this study was able to isolate the, the particular features that made bigness bigness because they did it with this really clever camera that's sort of metric and they worked out there are three measures that really matter to the bigness of a male. It's the size of his head, the length of his back, and the size of his butt. And if you've got those three things as a silverback, you're going to be very successful according to this study. <laughs> so what males are doing in the great mating game is they are competing with each other for permanent access to a group of females. Once those females are with the male, they guard them, they travel with them, they always know when a female is sexually receptive and they protect the group from outside danger. So what's a female strategy? Well, female gorillas 
when they turn about eight, they're also uh, reaching adolescence, and they very often leave the group they were born in and join other males uh, or other groups. And what their best strategy is for becoming a successful breeder is to choose a big, strong male to mate with, possibly judged on the basis of head size, butt size, and body length, and then to stay with him. Because what really matters to a female in the great mating game is getting enough food for herself and her offspring and protection for her vulnerable offspring. Now I keep talking about protection of groups of offspring. Protection from what? Um, well, leopards is one thing. There's certainly leopards, a lot of leopards in West Central Africa, not so many in the Virungas anymore. But it's very likely that a much bigger danger uh, to very young gor infant gorillas is other silverbacks. Because when a female with a very young infant finds herself with a silverback with whom she's unfamiliar, that she hasn't mated with, that silverback kills her infant. Now, why would he do that? Well, he would do that because when a female gives birth, she is not going to be sexually receptive again while she's nursing her infant, and that's for two and a half or three years. So this infant with a, kid, with a baby, for some reason, joins a silverback that she hasn't made it with, that she doesn't know, and he's going to have to wait at least two and a half years to mate, and he's going to have somebody else's kid in his group. If he kills that infant, she comes back into a fertile condition, receptive condition, within 10 days. Now, infanticide in gorillas is a fact of life. It's a male mating strategy. And it has, is seen in other social mammals, including lions, other monkeys, and even horses. It's relatively rare because females with young infants don't get mixed up with silverbacks they don't know. They stay next to the male in whose group they live. The most common context in which infanticide occurs is when the silverback of a group dies. And when that happens, and there's no younger male to take over. When that happens, the group disintegrates. All females join other groups or lone males. Females don't like being alone, and their infants are killed. Now, it is very likely that a silverback judges, I say in quotes, judges whether or not an infant is likely to be his based on his familiarity with the mother specifically whether or not he's mated with her. Um, and in that case, he is the soul of paternal tolerance with infants. Um, when infants lose their mothers, silverbacks take the orphans under their wing, let them sleep in their nest at night. Um, I think orphans actually have a much easier time in gorilla groups than they do in chimpanzee groups. Now this scenario where the best strategy for a female is to stay with, stay with a silverback, assuring him of paternity, um, and silverbacks are fighting one-on-one -on -one to gain permanent access to females. This is very different in um, the situation in chimpanzees, where there are many more males per female than a gorilla group, because Whereas male, male gorillas leave the group they were born in, chimpanzees don't. Chimpanzees stay together in the group they were born in. So it's, that's really a, a band of bros. And the most common um, interactions between adults in chimpanzees is between males. Now what these males do is they jointly and cooperatively defend a territory within which females roam and there are separate ranges and all the males have access to all the females. That's how that situation works, very different from gorillas. And as you uh, saw in the Jane film, 
gorilla males are, uh, uh, chimpanzee males are constantly vying for dominance. They, they're real political strategists. They, uh, their bromances are made, bromances are broken, they form alliances, they break, they're always looking for who they should curry favor with, who's dominant. It's all to try and get in a position of dominance. So it's not a simple thing of, like it is in, in gorillas, dominance is based on age. It's, this is in chimps, it's all based on this political maneuvering. And it has been discovered that uh, through, again, through, some, through paternity analysis that <clears throat> being high ranking for a chimp can give him an advantage in mating because sometimes he has, um, he's a little bit more able to sequester a female off on a concert chip. Um, and so he has a reproductive edge. But really, most of the time, mating in chimpanzees is pretty much a free-for-all. As you saw um, in the film, there's a, a, when females are uh, sexually receptive, they get these big uh, pink swellings on their bottoms for about a week to 10 days, and that attracts almost all the males in the community who follow her closely, and um, all of them mate with her, one right after the other sometimes. So what chimpanzee females do to um, protect themselves from infanticide, they, it's the opposite of what gorilla females do. They become completely promiscuous and they mate with everybody. So it's like a, you know, a lot of chimp males will come up and say, oh, a new baby, didn't we have a thing going maybe eight and a half months ago? And every male says that to her, because they all think maybe that could be mine. And so that system is very different. <clears throat> well, I hope, as I have whizzed through this, that I have given you uh, some idea for the differences between chimps and gorillas and why comparing, um, comparing two species can be very useful in trying to understand their societies. Um, the, I hope I've showed you that the influence of body size and, and diet has um, resounding effects on the nature of society. But I wanted to leave you tonight with my very last reason for studying apes and that is that research leads to conservation. <coughs> there is no long-term successful conservation project of apes in the world that has not started with a researcher going into the forest like Jane Goodall or like Diane Fossey or Gal Dukas, setting up a tent and starting a long-term study. There are at least seven parks in Africa, national parks that were created starting the kernel of that is a research camp in the forest. Researchers work with national park authorities, they help train guards and guides, their findings are vital to successful ecotourism projects. And certainly, people like Jane Goodall, Diane Fossey, bring, the, bring gorillas and chimpanzees, bring them to the attention of the world. And this can influence the efforts that are made for conservation, um, even the legislation, certainly the funding that will help conserve these animals. Now, it is very depressing these days to read anything about apes in Africa because they're in terrible shape in most places. They're being hammered by commercial logging, especially in the West Central Africa, and, and really, really hit by the bushmeat trade. They're being killed right, left, and center for their meat. And it's very easy to get discouraged. So what I want to leave you with is the story of the mountain gorillas in Rwanda. In 1960, there was a census uh, before the animals were habituated, before a long-term study had begun, that estimated 500 gorillas in the Virunga volcanoes. But they were facing problems. Uh, it's a very densely populated, very uh, human population is very dense in that area. Their, uh, their habitat was being lost 
to farming, um, large-scale appropriations of their habitat. There was some hunting for trophies for the pet trade. In 1972, they were down to 275 animals. Uh, at the end of the 70s, uh, one of Diane Fossey's study groups was attacked by poachers. Two silverbacks were killed. Their heads were cut off to sell as trophies. Female was killed, the whole group disintegrated, um, infants were killed. <clears throat> Diane alerted every journalist she knew, every influential people she could think of um, to this plight. And it resulted in a huge conservation project that is now f a famously successful conservation project. It really started in 1981 when the population had reached its nadir, and then it started to recover. Unfortunately, Diane Fossey did not live to see this turnaround. She was murdered in Rwanda uh, in, 19, in 1984. But her legacy continues. And by 2003, the population was back up to 380. Now remember, this is through the horrors of 1994 genocide and half a million refugees going right through their park, militia in the park, rebels in the park, landmines going off. This population of gorillas kept on increasing because of the dedication of the park guides and the park rangers that would still go out and monitor them despite the dangers. In 2010, the population had almost reached the original 1960 estimate. And the 2017 um, results haven't been published yet, but there are more than 480, possibly getting closer to 500. So I just want to tell you that when you get discouraged about ape conservation or any conservation, remember the mountain gorillas. Don't give up. Thank you. We want to open it up for a Q&A. Um, what's the average life on a gorilla and a, and a chimpanzee? Average lifespan? Yeah. Um, in the wild, males tend to die in their late 20s. 20. And you know, males, there's more wear and tear on males than on females. The oldest female was, I believe, um, the oldest female was, I believe, 40 or a little older than 40. But the, I think the oldest male was 38. So I'm, I'm just talking average here, but yeah. you know, late 20s, 30s for males, late 30s for females. Wonderful. And how many babies do they usually have a female? They, uh, how many infants in their lifetime? Mm -hmm. They give birth once every four years. And about, a female is doing very well if she has eight surviving offspring in her life. Most of them do not have eight. That's doing really well. Most of them have about five that they rear to adulthood. Wow. Let's open it up to the audience questions. Is there any kind of, in quotes, succession planning in the groups? So you have the dominant male, the silverback. Do they look at any of the males as a possible successor positively? keep the group together, or are they all pretty much pushed out? Well, that's a very good question. Um, the question was, is there, is there any kind of grooming of a successor uh, by the silverback trying to, to, trying to get him to stay? Um, uh, we actually wrote a paper on that a long time ago, um, and it was just comparing two similar sized similar aged males in the group and one did seem to have a closer relationship with the dominant silverback he grew they groomed he groomed him more it was more the younger male grooming the older male so occurring favor um, and you know that when males leave they aren't kicked out they're just fed up and they get they actually just get further and further away each day until they start traveling on their own um, it would certainly seem to make sense to have a successor because then the group isn't left in the lurch when the silverback dies. But 
you know, then you have to share the mating. Yeah. So you have to kind of weigh the pros and cons. We have a question over here. Um, did you see all of the gorilla species? Did you see all of the gorilla species? The silverbacks and the must other I species? saw, we saw all of the gorilla um, species, you mean in West Africa and East Africa, or you mean all the gorillas in the group? All of the gorillas in the world. <laughs> all the gorillas in the world. How many different kinds of gorillas have you, have you been able to um, observe? We have uh, worked with mountain gorillas. I've seen eastern lowland gorillas, which are very similar, but you know, you can tell the difference. And then Sandy and I worked in Nigeria with western lowland gorillas. So I think we probably have pretty much covered it. <laughs> uh, we got, let's see, we got any questions over here? Oh, go right here, Kennedy. Uh, there was a brief mention of, uh, of meat consumption by the chimpanzees. But you were talking about diet. It, it, what's the difference there? Where did that come from? How, how prevalent is that in terms of the chimpanzees eating their, their rivals or the kids? Oh, meat consumption. Meat consumption. Yeah. yeah. Um, chimpanzees hunt monkeys. And, you know, hunting's a big activity in a lot of chimpanzee groups. Gorillas do not hunt. They don't eat meat. They eat termites, like chimps but they don't make tools to get the termites out of their concrete hard mounds. They just walk along and smash it open. <laughs> so, you know, Sandy and I have argued, you know, gorilla body size allows them to not need to make tools, uh, but they definitely do not hunt like chimpanzees do. That's their protein. Yeah, their pro protein for gorillas are bugs, but they also, even though, um, I kind of describe them as indiscriminate salad eaters. The, the bits of the plant they eat are pretty nutritious for protein. So they eat the bits of plants that are young and growing. They eat a lot of uh, bamboo shoots, with, which are full of protein. So, you know, it's not, it's not only animals and, and stuff that has the protein. They, they get quite a lot of protein. Yeah. How, how do they, how can they eat so much to get to that size? When they start out well, one advantage to having a large body size as a species is that you can afford to eat a low quality diet. And that's one of the big differences between chimps and gorillas. So chimps have gone for large body, low quality food, slow moving. Chimps or the kind of sportier model, the smaller sportier model, and they race around after fruit. And when you are with a gorilla and you see him eating, you can just see his stomach getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, they eat a lot of salad. They eat, they eat it all the time. You know, they spend a large part of their day eating um, vegetation. And I think chimps, you know, if they get a good fruit meal, they've got a little bit more free time. Because it's a much house. higher quality diet. Yeah. Any more questions for Dr. Hart? Oh, we got one right down here. That's going to hold it right up to me. Have you met Jean? I have. I have. I've never been to Gombe Stream, but I have met Jane at conferences. Sandy and I were at a, a conference in Indonesia where Jane was there, and it was um, it's wonderful to be around her. She has, a, she has a great presence, as, as you've seen from this film, and she's the most wonderfully articulate person. When you're out in the um, jungles with the gorillas, are you ever afraid? Because that aggressive scene with her, with the chimpanzees, yeah, how do you handle that? I think I've been afraid of a gorilla once. When, they, when you first are habituating them, the males charge, and you're supposed to hold your ground. And I did. Everybody does, because you're not supposed to run. But there was one male who sounded particularly angry, and it was just the sound of his scream. And I was afraid, but I'm saying once. And I've always said that if I had to choose being stuck in an elevator with a chimp or a gorilla, I would take a gorilla any day. <laughs> I mean, aggression is more important to chimps. We got one right here. So Matt, can you hand him a microphone right there? 
Um, so you made the, the point, or which, between gorillas You can hold up to your mouth a little, little bit more so we can hear. Okay. Um, between gorillas and chimps, which society do you think is, um, so both societies are male dominated, but which one do you think is more, like more patriarchal? Because it seems that chimps have like a, like the, um, it's harder to get like to the fruit, um, the ripe fruit is like more um, based on their, like the fission fusion society. So it seems like chimps have um, less bonds and um, the females are like more easily dominated, but gorillas have more access to like the vegetation around them so that they don't have to rely as much on males. They don't what? Like gorillas, it seems like gorilla, the, the female females gorillas. are like, yeah, they don't have to like rely as much on males. So which society do you think is more male dominated? Both in their own way, in very, very different ways. Um, I think in gorillas, the male is absolutely dominant in the group. I think females depend on the males for protection, but I think female choice is very important in deciding what groups they live in, because when you see a female transfer from one group to another, it really and truly does look like her choice. She's not being herded by males. Um, chimpanzees are male dominated in other ways. And males are very aggressive to females, um, especially when you know they display at them and they sometimes attack them when females are are re sexually receptive. It, you know, it's hard to say. I would say maybe equally male dominated in both ways, but female choice certainly in gorillas is an important factor in the society. And in the other species of chimpanzee, bonobos, males, uh, females have much more power, and males, uh, very close relatives, males have less power than in common chimpanzees. Dr. Harcourt, I'd like to thank you so much for coming tonight. This has been really fascinating. I know you're going to be around for a little while. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.